everyone and welcome to the latest afternoon tea and talk with the State Library of Victoria. My name is Astrid Edwards. I am coming to you from Collingwood, Melbourne, and I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations on whose land I live and work. I would like to acknowledge elders, past, present and emerging, and I would also like to note that sovereignty was never ceded. As I said, my name is Astrid Edwards and I love books and I love writers. I am the host of two bookish podcasts, The Garrett Writers on Writing and Anonymous Was a Woman. And talking to writers is basically how I understand the world, reading their books and talking, talking to writers. And today I'm going to ask the brilliant Kate Millenhall to explain to me how the world is working. Kate, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Astrid. And unfortunately, I cannot answer that question. I can answer lots of questions about books, but how the world is working, particularly today, I don't have a clue. Look, it is, uh, it's a big call, I know. But now, Kate, you are a novelist, you are a teacher, and you, of course, are a podcaster as well. You are the co-host of too. the First Time Podcast, also about books. And this year, you published The Mother Fault. The Mother Fault is, I can see it there behind you, and I have my copy here, The Mother Fault. <laughs> I've got so many copies here. <laughs> this is an exceptional novel. And so congratulations. I've said that to you. Thank before, you, Astrid. I really mean it. I love that you are bringing back dystopian literary fiction to the Australian scene. It makes me very happy. Today, I'm going to ask you to talk about The Mother Fault and particularly how, how books, how literature can help us understand politics and crises and the world around us. But before I do, I just want to remind everybody who's watching that you can ask Kate questions today. Just type them into the Slido, to sli type them into the Slido function. The code is hashtag afternoon tea and talk. Afternoon tea and talk will, will mean that you can ask Kate anything. Now, Kate, you and I know that we are speaking against the backdrop of the US election. I hope that we provide some light relief if anybody is currently doom scrolling yes. and obsessing <laughs> over, over that. But while we are not here to talk politics, I do have some questions about politics for you. Books help us think about and understand the grand movements of history. You know, they help us, they give us a way to figure out what is happening. So you, as, as a writer and as a teacher, what do you think the role, what do you think the role books have in terms of understanding crises? Oh, it's, it's a huge question. I think that they are, that they are necessary to reflect back to us, both, both historically, you know, my first, my first book was historical fiction. Um, and I read a lot of that as, as well as spec fic, um, and everything in between. And I think that, they give us that art gives us that distance through which we can look at what's happening at any particular time and say, ah, oh. and, and also to help us pay attention to those things that, that we may have stopped paying attention to. So, and partly when you say about how books help us, you know, writing the mother fault was, was me trying to sort out all of my feelings about the political situation in our own country, political situations around the world, um, the idea of, of populist governments and what that could possibly mean, the slippery slope from um, for those who hold power into what becomes something frighteningly, frighteningly different. So, so I think also at a really selfish individual level as artists and, and writers, we're so we're working through our own stuff and our own questions about all those times as well. So, going on from that, yeah. For those who haven't read the Mother Fault, and honestly, I think everybody should. Can you introduce us? You know, the thirty second intro to the Mother Fault, so I can ask you some more hard questions. Of course you can. So the mother fault is set in a very near future Australia. And, and honestly, it wasn't meant to be quite as close as it has felt this year with a pandemic uh, and a COVID safe app and all the rest of it. But um, so it's set near future Australia and it's basically the story of Mim and Mim is a geologist. She's been out of work for about 10 years, raising her two kids, Essie and Sam. And when the book opens, her husband, Ben, who's also, um, works in geology and engineering has gone missing on an Indonesian mine site. And uh, when, when Mim tries to work out 
where it is and, and what's happened. She's basically told by the department, who are the new governing body, that she should um, stop asking questions. She should stay at home, surrender her passport. And if she thinks about doing anything else, then they, of course, will, will take her children away from her. So that sets off this road trip, sailing trip, kind of literary thriller-ish kind of book that has for me and lots of other people kind of defied uh, being put into any genre. <laughs> it does blend genres. And as you said before, uh, you didn't intend it to be, to feel so close in 2020. It does feel incredibly close. It feels like it could just be set in, you know, January 21, you know, to be honest, that's how close it feels. But like, it's literary. I do think it is dystopian yep. fiction. It is certainly a thriller. Did you intend to write this kind of genre? I mean, you're essentially writing with a female heroine in the tradition of Margaret Atwood and The Handmaid's Tale. That's absolutely. And, you know, Atwood, Atwood's a, a hero of mine. I certainly took into account her idea that, um, particularly in Handmaid's Tale, that everything that happens in Gilead uh, has occurred before. And, you know, I am a teacher, I'm a history teacher. I used the historical record to help me decide what what kind of weapons of the state my department would have. And that is they use surveillance as, as a weapon of the state, um, that disappearances, the taking away of children, like they're all things that happen all across the world, including in Australia um, today, for the government to to wield their power. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I knew that that's what I wanted to do, but really, Astrid, all I did was I started with this um, utter rage about the state of our border policies and um, in, in Australia um, and this this image of a woman leaving Australia with her kids. And, you know, I've talked about this before, but I've got two young kids and I was deep in the trenches of motherhood, which was I would both kill for my children and I want to throw them in the rubbish bin quite constantly. And so I was also kind of grappling with, grappling with that idea at the same time. But I didn't, it was only when I realised that to to get the right context for Mim to have to flee Australia, I needed to build an entire society with a plausible kind of um, uh, danger in it and, and risk for her to go. And that was exhausting, but kind of fun as well. Kind of fun to do that and to play with it. I don't want anyone listening to think that this is just some kind of thriller. This is a real character driven no novel. Mim, the mother, she, she really is a heroine, but until she, you know, has these things happen to her and until she actively makes the choices that she does and takes the actions yeah. that she does, she's just a mum, you know, like that's how she would be categorised by a society. She's certainly not some kind of action hero figure. And I really did appreciate reading a thriller, reading an action adventure that, you know, involves so many different uh, modes of transport and um, unexpected <laughs> <different> <laughs> turns. It does. But it's someone who maybe I could be if I found myself in such an extreme uh, political environment, um, an extreme climate change world, uh, you know, what would I decide? You certainly did your research for this novel. One of those modes of transport, of course, is a boat trip from Australia to Indonesia. And I remain in awe of that. <laughs> dedication to your craft. Can you please tell our listeners what research you actually did to bring this to life? Well, I, I can, I was worried that I wasn't, I didn't understand how scary it would be to be in the middle of the ocean on a yacht. So I decided that I should, should do that, should get on a yacht. Um, but I didn't really know anyone who had a yacht. And, and in my research, the research for the mother fault involved me having um, just a big map of Australia um, on my wall. And then I kept on kind of putting the road trip in. And then when I realized, oh, they have to go from Darwin really to get on this yacht into Indonesia, I started searching for, you know, yachts. How do you get a yacht from Darwin to Indonesia? And then I found a yacht race. And, 
which was very exciting. So I emailed and I said, you know, I don't know if you'd take me. I've got absolutely no experience, but I'm very friendly and enthusiastic and um, I'd love to be on your crew. And they ended up saying yes, Astrid. And it was extraordinary. I, I got on board this yacht with um, six people I didn't know, one other woman with whom I was hot bunking. So we were sharing a bunk because we were on um, separate shifts. And it was just the most extraordinary, extraordinary experience. I was terrified. I did think that it, <laughs> I was going to die in the middle of the ocean, but I got that kind of um, the knowledge of the boat, of the way it feels when you're on a yacht and it kind of surfs down a wave. Just, I could never have understood that without without being on it. And then the experience of being in Indonesia as well on, on the island of Ambon um, for another three or four days. Uh, just amazing. And it made me feel really brave. It made me feel a little bit like that idea. Like I left my two kids at home, you know, I, I did not think I was up to the challenge, but when I got home, I was filled with a new kind of energy that, you know, if you just do one thing and then the next thing, and then you keep on going, you know, you can get that kind of big stuff done. So it was, it was great on numerous levels. It is such an excellent story. And not only does it speak to your craft uh, as a writer and your dedication to what you produce, it reminds me that writers share with us bits of the world, experiences that we aren't going to have ourselves or that we can't have ourselves. You know, I'm not going to get on a boat and sail from Darwin to Ambon in Indonesia, most likely, but I can kind it's of- It's fun though, I recommend <laughs> Maybe it. I'll put it on my 2021 to-do list. Yeah. Now, Kate, there is an old joke that a writer can't write dystopian as just a dystopian story if they're living in a dystopia you know because it requires such imagination and such forward thinking and such research and yet this year it kind of feels like we are living in you know what a few years ago would have been called a dystopia and would have been Absolutely. impossible i really respect your thinking and the research that you've done around how you depict kind of our near term future. What type of stories or literature do you think is gonna come out of this year? And I'm not just talking about the US presidential election, which is top of mind. I'm talking about the coronavirus, talking about the bushfires, I'm talking about climate change. What are we gonna see? Well, it's really hard, isn't it? Because I think that one of the things that writers need, unless you're Ali Smith, is a little bit of space to, to um, to kind of compost that experience. And I know, you know, I think it's extraordinary. I listened to your interview with um, Richard Flanagan and, you know, it's extraordinary what he did in, in terms of writing over last summer, this kind of, um, you know, in, in situ in real time to get that sense of the fires. And I too, for the mother fault, um, I had to go back and, e and edit uh, some sections where she's looking at this fire affected landscape because after our summer and we were caught up in the fires a bit, um, you know, I, I already in the writing had, had not predicted far enough ahead. So I think that, that writers are caught in this moment where, where they're trying to grapple with what's happening right now. Um, I think that, I think that it's so interesting though, to be in that soup. And I think that what I want to see is people embracing it. And I love that idea um, of Flanagan doing that. Like, okay, well, maybe that is a way, maybe there is more breadth and give in the way that we're publishing so that we can get books out like that, that are reflecting as well as having books that need a longer think time as, as well to come out with it. So I, I, I think there'll be a little bit of both. It's interesting that you, thank you for listening to the Richard Flanagan interview. For those listening, essentially Richard, kind of thought that we would have a bad bushfire season. Mm. So he scoped out a novel, did the whole structure and a lot of the thinking, and then sat down and rewrote it as the fires were burning to make it feel like the fires are burning when you read it. It's an extraordinary uh, novel. But Kate, going back to the mother fault, there is a conversation between Mim, our heroine, and her children. And basically her daughter is kind of saying, why didn't you do more why didn't your generation fix it or at least avoid the worst? And she's kind of talking about everything. She's talking about the environment. She's talking about an Australia that is not a happy place and has become a surveillance state. And so my question to you is, firstly, that's a tough thing to write. You are a mother. Yeah. But also how does a book 
or all books open that conversation between generations? Like, well, I, I, you know, I think the biggest thing and the incredible joy of writing this as my kids aged into that age, they're nine and seven now, where they did start asking those questions and just kind of with astonishment, what do you mean, mum? Like that can't be real or that can't be happening. And and when you start having that le- level of conversation and also seeing the extraordinary kinds of social political movements that have occurred, have always occurred, but really recently and up in um that that young people are leading and and I think that that was also a backdrop for me as I was writing like these these young people have got lots of the answers and they will judge us on the fact that we have failed you know utterly failed to act so I think you know I think um people writing in YA and middle grade fiction um and and picture books too they know this like they I always think they have um a far higher level of, of continual respect that sometimes um, as adults not working in that area, we have to remind ourselves. We have to continually kind of remind ourselves. The kids know this. That is such a lovely reminder that the kids do know this and they're looking at us thinking, what are we doing? What are we doing? What, what are, are we, doing? we doing? Now, you know that I understand the world through books and I suspect that you are quite similar, Kate. And so I know that you've been touring the motherfold, but when you feel overwhelmed or when you find yourself thinking about these massive changes that we are all experiencing, what authors or books do you turn to? Oh my gosh, I have so many books. I have so many books to show you. Um, you know, one of the things that it, that is really joyous for me is that because I've got kids, I, I do not... Um, stop myself buying picture books for my kids. So um, one of the ones that I want to show, which is just so a book for this year is Extraordinary by Penny Harrison, which is just a paying attention, being in nature kind of a book, which I think has been part, I don't know for you, but part of our lockdown experience, just looking, going quietly. And also this one was a big one in our family this year, Finding Our Heart. Um, which is about the Uluru Statement. And I think all those kinds of things, like, of course, you show these to the kids, the kids understand it. I think this one, Amberlynn Quaymelina's Living on Stolen Land, I, I posted about this earlier in the year and I actually think that this should be in every house in Australia. Like that would be a, a, a pretty cool thing to to commit to for this Christmas. Um, it's And it's it's beautifully produced too. It's got images. It's just, it's a beautiful book. Um, I can tell you, Kate, I, um, I, I sent my nine-year-old niece, Olivia, that book and she keeps it on her bookshelf and she's really proud because it's the first poetry collection that she's been given. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff in the house, but this is the first poetry collection that she's been given. I love that. And it's the kind of thing that wouldn't have been on our bookshelves for you and no. I when we were nine. No. And do you know the other thing? I've actually, I've got, um, this is another poetry collection that actually... Um, Nadi Simpson, who wrote Song of the Crocodile, which is a book that I absolutely loved and highly recommend. And that was one that got me through lockdown. That is exactly it. Um, Just beautiful. I think all those ones that um, I'm so longing for places, (laughs) so longing to be somewhere other than inside my house. And Nadi just writes place and country like this song she's the songwriter that's what it sounds like but she recommended this um poetry book and I also think lots of the podcasts I listen to and people I've been following on social media have recommended poems this year like single poems as a real kind of balm I think to you know as as a slowing down almost like these kind of um prayers or incantations I think this would, um, I have to I have oh, to no, tell us this. One. the lost soul is that YA <laughs> This is a middle grade YA. This is Zana Freylon, who, of course, the incredible writer of um, The Bone Sparrow. But this is Riddles. This is why I picked it up. Riddles, Incantations and Hope. So I think I think um, this book I got to the end of and I thought the, the kids are just so smart. The kids are so smart. And it deals with, as all Zana's books do, it deals with big issues like youth homelessness. Um, it deals with death, uh, the afterlife. But it's just... And it just got nominated for the Carnegie along with Bren's book, Across the Risen Sea, which is another dystopia for middle grade 
readers, amazing, amazing book. And how incredible that we have two Carnegie nominees just in our gang. That That is a wonderful testament to the books being written in Australia right now. And I want to go back to what you just said, like the kids know this stuff. The kids do know this stuff. And we as adults, I think, and I'm guilty of this too, sometimes police what they read or sometimes think something is too too much for them. And yet they turn on the news or they listen to our conversations or they walk down the street of a capital city if they're not in lockdown and they know. And I feel like I was talking to Jamila Rizvi the other day about her new kids book. And she said, we need to give the children the respect give them the words that they can understand what is happening around them. And um, thank you for those recommendations. I hope that people listening just uh, wrote down those recommendations for uh, middle grade and, uh, and kids books. Kate, I know that you have some other recommendations for adults, but before we go into those recommendations, how do you approach reading or like, what does reading mean to you? Like, where do you go when you need a bit of help? I, I have a very big, one of my shelves up here behind me is um, my very long um, shelf of writers on writing or, or artists on creativity. And I think going back to that in times, especially this year where, you know, in, in terms of kind of economic crisis and all the rest of it, you know, there were, there were moments where I was like, that's it. I should go back and I should retrain to be a nurse. Like I should do something more useful with my time. What is this? Like, how can I justify spending my time putting words on a page and, and kind of making art? But I, I, what I love is that it's also times like this when people say we need art and we need people to, to do the, the thinking and the reflecting and to um, hold the mirror up. And, and that's why it was so surreal. It was so surreal at the start of this year when I was doing the copy edits for the mother fault and you know, this whole world that I've created and, um, the rhetoric that they're using in the book is like, we're all in this together and we're going to get through this and you should all get this incredibly invasive surveillance because that'll make us all safe. And I was like, what have I done? Like <laughs> I've, created this, I've created this nightmare, but, um, and, and as much as that was terrifying and I was a little bit scared of the kind of conversations that I've been drawn, drawn into, especially if they involved conspiracy theories, but I, I did like that I had asked the reader I was basically asking the reader to pay attention to the world around them and I think that's what you know so I am chomping at the bit I didn't get sent a copy of Helen Garner's new diaries after I don't know why everyone else in Melbourne seemed to have got a copy but um I'm I'm desperately looking forward to that because I think watching how artists reflect on times is is so incredibly important but also I just have stacks like we talked before we went live Astrid about the fact that we will probably get seriously injured by the stacks of books that that are around us at at any given time so I like to have um a non-fiction you know some essays and then a you know a good hearty pull me through kind of fiction book all going at the same time um, to, to get me through dark days. And I think I read more. I do actually think that I read more this year as well. I did too. All right. So what re- recommendations for adults do you have for us, Kate? Oh my gosh. I'm picking out this one first because it's bright pink and it's so ace. It's been a pleasure. Noni Blake is Claire Christian's um, book. Like talking about women heroes. <laughs> Noni Blake is a legend. Uh, it's it's a very sexy kind of rom-com. It's funny. It made me laugh out loud. I read it very, very quickly and I highly recommend it. It's like the summer beach read. Get it for everyone that you know. Um, and this, you will have read this already, Astrid. I haven't, but but I picked this up last week. Um, I love Jeff, Jeff Sparrow's very thoughtful review of it in the Saturday paper, Living with the Anthropocene um, book of essays. And I think like I, I can never have enough of these books of essays lying around. I think we have to be engaging with it, especially this year. Like we just can't not engage with it anymore. So that's another one that I really recommend. And for your writerly, readerly people, Tegan Bennett Day- um, Daylight's The Details, these essays are just magnificent on reading, on on artists, on death and um, family, just beautiful. She's the most beautiful writer. Um, yeah, highly recommend. They're wonderful recommendations, Kate. And I'm glad that you had some uh, essay collections in there because I know a lot of people that I speak to, both writers and readers, 
have had some concentration problems this year, given yes. um, everything there is to think about. And an essay is, of course, short. You can dip yep. in and out as opposed to being stuck with, you know, two, three, four, five hundred pages if you don't feel uh, quite up to it. Excellent Absolutely. recommendations. Kate, I want to recommend The Mother Fault for everybody who is watching. And that is because this book gave me solace and entertainment. It's a great read. I mean, this is entertaining. But Kate, it's been out for a while. I know it has, well, for a while, I mean a few months. I know it has gone to reprint. How many reprints? I, I didn't ask. I didn't ask about the reprint, Astrid. It's too stressful, all these all this information this year. Well, I'm going to say that getting a reprint in Australia so quickly is a very big deal, and it means that everybody bought the book, which is a very big deal. Um, but it's been out long enough for you to be getting lots of feedback from yep. readers. Can you tell me how people have reacted, particularly with female heroine? Oh, my goodness. So, so some of the most incredible images and messages that I'm getting are from um, women uh, and I suspect a lot of them are mothers who send me pictures with like underlines of bits where, Ma, where Mim is, you know, basically fed up with her life. Um, there's a section where, you know, where Mim is saying basically I, I could have been a hero too, but I was, I was doing school pickup. Like that's, that's my life. So they send me that. I love, there was a very um, gorgeous review that Beck Kavanagh did where she said <laughs> that, um, that Mim's a little bit like uh, Liam Neeson in Taken, but she, but feminist kind of has to look after the kids. And I'm loving that. A lot of people also, Astrid, who are saying, I wouldn't normally read this kind of book, which is so interesting because also what kind of book is it? Like, I'm not sure if they're saying I wouldn't normally read dystopian or I wouldn't normally read a book with a female protagonist who's a mum, or I'm not sure what they're saying, but, um, but, but they've, they've loved it. A, a few, um, a few people think that Mim, Mim is very flawed. Mim is very flawed, but a few people have been angry at some of the decisions, uh, that she makes. And my most asked question is, when's the sequel coming out? I have asked you that before. And that is on my list of questions in front of me. <laughs> The beauty about dabbling in the dystopian thriller space is everybody is actually expecting to fork out money for the sequel, Kate. So I do I think know. you should take advantage of this. I know. I, I, I really didn't realise. One of the interesting things that, and it's been great having this conversation, I've been speaking to a lot of book clubs um, in the last couple of weeks, which has been really fun because it's the only time you get to talk about the spoilers. <laughs> and everyone has an opinion. Everyone has an opinion about everything. But also that idea that, that where the book finishes, um, of course, as a writer, you know, I wrote like, a hundred thousand extra words that aren't in the book. We all do that in, in all the drafts, but there was this very fine point where if I had have written any further, it was like, um, yeah, it, it, it was absolutely that sequel territory. It's like going into a whole new world and all the possibilities, like something kind of opening up and unfolding in front of me. And I was like, well, no, that is too much. And of course I'm, I'm deep in research for my, for my new novel now. And that's the other thing I think that, um, we're so lucky as writers that we that we become completely obsessed with the new material <laughs> and then nothing else exists. So book two, wow. The Mother Fault was sailing and uh, the, the new book is Butchery. So uh, I'm currently obsessed with butchery. So, you know, watch you, this space. <laughs> are you going to go to an abattoir or are you mm -hmm. going to fight? You are. Yeah. It's just been very difficult given the COVID situation. Given the abattoir and the lockdown. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I've okay. got a very clear research plan for, for when I'm allowed out. Kate, I really admire the dedication to the research that you give uh, to your books. Not Well, I think most writers do, but I mean, you take it to an extreme level. <laughs> I do. I do Up a little. Bit. Extreme, extreme level. Um, we are almost out of time. Kate, I want to thank you so much for coming to talk to the State Library on Afternoon Tea and Talk. It is an absolute pleasure to speak to you again. And just in case no one saw it before, <laughs> this is what everybody in my family is getting for Christmas. And I think that you should definitely uh, put it on your Christmas shopping lists. Kate, thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Astrid, for having me. Delight to speak to you today. An afternoon tea and talk will be back in a fortnight and our next guest is Maxine Benneba-Clark.
enjoy everybody. Thank you.